Good morning, everybody. I'm going to give everybody uh, two minutes to join and then we will start. Good morning, those of you joining. We're going to start in about one minute. While people are still joining, <clears throat> let me just share this screen real quick. So for those of you still just joining, a quick little preview of what's due this week. So lots of stuff due this week. So what we have is annotate, photo, but, 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 draw. So this coming week, lots of good stuff. So today, PLC 8 and 9 uploaded to Mastering Physics by the end of the day. Tomorrow, Labs 5, 6, and 7 uploaded to Mastering Physics by the end of the day. Thursday, Chapter 9 homework due by 8.59 p.m. That's when it must be submitted and done by. Quiz, Chapter 9 on Friday, again, by 8.59. All right, so let's stop that mouse. Stop share. Okay, what I want to do is a little recap and then finish up chapter nine. So let me share this one note and let's go to April 7th. So let me just do a little quick recap of not everything, but what we covered yesterday. All right, and I want to draw on this. So remember that our work energy principle basically says that the sum of the work done by all external forces equals the change in energy of the system. And from that, I looked at for a single particle, it's really tough writing on this. What we found was that the integral of X initial to X final of FX DX was equal to one half MV final squared minus one half m v initial squared. So this right here is our definition of work. And it always, 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 always applies. You can always use the integral of fx dx from x initial to x final to find the work. And this left hand, right hand side is just our change in kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is one half m v squared. Keep in mind, V is speed, not velocity. If the force is constant, the magnitude and direction are both constant, then the work is equal to the dot product of F dotted with delta R. The magnitude of F times the magnitude of delta R times the cosine of the angle between it. Keep sure. in mind, whether work is positive, negative, or zero only depends upon the angle between the force and the displacement. If the angle is between zero and 90, that force is doing positive work and adding energy to the system. Yeah. If the angle is 90 degrees, the work done by that force is zero. If the angle is between 90 and 180, that force is doing negative work. We also saw that the work done by gravity is equal to negative mg delta y. And one you important always thing, put the system, right? hold on one sec, is, yeah. is path independent. Meaning, if I have an object which starts here and ends here, my delta y, in this case, is just the difference between my initial and final position. The thing about gravity is it doesn't matter how you get from your initial to final position. So I lift an object straight up, I'm doing a certain amount of work, 
But if instead of going straight up, I took some weird curved path, the amount of work done by gravity is still going to be the same. And that's kind of what I covered on yesterday. What I want to do is just quickly open it up for two minutes of questions. Let me just see what's on the chat. Chat. Why can't I see it? Chat. Meeting controls. Labs are due by tomorrow or tonight at midnight. So PLCs are due tonight. Labs are due tomorrow. Uh, two participants raised hands. I can't see right now. Who's got a question? Jordan. I do. Um, so would work for gravity, cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So Correct. something is at a 90 degree angle, does that mean gravity does no work on it? I'm sorry, say that one more time. If something moves at a 90 degree angle, does that mean gravity does no work on it? So if I move an object horizontally, so if I draw, and we'll do an example in a second, but I mean, if I have an object that starts here and ends here and moves to the right, then right, gravity acts straight down mg. And if the object is moving horizontally, then the angle between the force and the displacement is zero, which means gravity's not doing any work if the elevation doesn't change. Okay, that that's pretty I answer the question? Okay, so let me go down and just do a little example here. So let's say that, just to give you an example, I had a box started here. I exerted some tension force on it at some angle, theta, and the box ended up moving to the right. So my displacement, delta x, is to the right. And let's say I wanted to figure out the work done by every single force. So one, let's just say that there is friction acting. Quick little question, how many different forces on this system do I need to consider doing work? So I've got tension pulling this box at some angle. This is moving to the right. There is friction. How many different forces do I need to look at that are doing work on this object? Or at least how many different forces are acting on it? And if I were to draw a free body diagram, the answer is four. So I've got tension, which is acting at some angle theta. I've got the normal force. I've got gravity, mg. And if there's kinetic friction, it's going to act in the opposite direction of motion. Each one of these, I would then calculate the work. And since these forces are constant, I could just use the work done by each force is the force times the displacement, times the cosine of the angle between the two. So let's just look. What forces, what angles would I use? If I were looking at this particular system where the thing is being displaced to the right, then I'm always looking at the angle between that particular force and the displacement. So for the normal force, this thing is being displaced to the right. The normal force acts straight up. The angle I would use would be 90 degrees. And in this case, the normal force is not doing any work. Tension, the angle between tension and the displacement in this case would just be whatever that angle theta is. That's some angle between zero and 90 degrees, which means tension would be doing positive work. Gravity is acting straight down. The object is moving to the right. The angle I would use would be 90 degrees. In this case, gravity is not doing any work. And for kinetic friction, the object's moving to the right. The force is to the left. The angle would be 180 degrees. So the work done by kinetic friction would be negative. So the only thing that determines whether work is positive, negative, or zero is the angle between that force and the work. Uh, I found out it doesn't show how you got it. Uh, it doesn't show. Is there any way we could get PLC answer keys so we no longer get them checked off at the STEM center? Oh, that's a great question. The answer is yes. I will. Hmm. I'll find a way of getting everybody to PLCs. What I'll probably do is post the solutions after they are due to the uh, online resources page. But it shows the only kinetic energy. Okay, you are welcome. 
So what I want to do is continue forth with this new material and basically finish chapter, let me get rid of this, finish chapter nine. Okay, so let me just remind you that this equation, the work done by external forces, which equals the integral of fx dx from x initial to x final equals one half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared. So just as a reminder, when I derived this, this was for a single particle acted on by a single force. Now what I wanna do is talk about what happens if I have multiple forces acting on it and I have more than one particle. And the big takeaway is just this. The total work done by all forces acting on a system equals the total change in energy of the system. So if I have more than one force acting on a system, I have to just look at the work done by all external forces. So this right here on the left-hand side is the total work done by all external forces. And this right-hand side is the change in energy of all particles in the system. So let's say I had 10 different objects in the system. I would have to look at the total change in energy of all objects in the system. So this is the change in energy of all objects in the system. So what I wanna do is just give you an example. So when I'm looking at a system, one, you define your system. Anything that's not the system is the environment. Any force of the environment exert on the system is work done by an external force that will change the energy of the system. So what I wanna do is look at an example problem that'll help illustrate this. So this is, can I make this bigger? Example problem 9A the very last one. It says, in the figure below, a horizontal force FA of magnitude 20 newtons is applied to a three kilogram psychology book as the book slides a distance, my erasers, a distance 0.5 meters up a frictionless ramp at an angle of 30 degrees. During the displacement, what is the net work done on the book by FA, the gravitational force on the book, the normal force? <laughs> If the book has zero displacement, has zero kinetic energy at the start, what is its speed at the bottom? Annotate, let me clear all drawings. Okay. Uh, go back to mouse. Okay, so I have three different forces acting on this system. I'm just gonna call my system here. Let me write on this system. We're just going to consider this the psychology book. So my external forces are basically, I've got the normal force, I've got force A, and I've got gravity, Mg. And what I wanna know is what is the work done by each one of these forces? So if I were to draw a free body diagram, what I have is Fa is acting to the right, my normal force is always perpendicular to the surface and gravity mg is always acting straight down. Now my displacement is upwards along the ramp. So here's my delta x if you want to call it or delta or d. So what I care about when looking at the work is the angle between the force and the displacement. So before I write this down, just take 30 seconds what do you think the angle is going to be for the normal force? What is the angle going to be for FA? And what is the angle going to be for gravity? And then we'll kind of go through that in a second. Jordan, do you have a quick question? No, my hand was raised earlier, but I, you answered it. OK, uh, you can uh, unraise your hand. It's still showing it if you want. Great. OK, so the angle we care about is the angle between that force and the displacement. 
So for the normal force, if I look, the normal force is perpendicular to the ramp. The displacement is along the ramp. The angle for the normal force is going to be 90 degrees. The angle between FA and X is just going to be the angle of the ramp. So this angle is going to be 30 degrees. And for the force of gravity, gravity is acting straight down MG, but my displacement is along the ramp. And this angle right here was 30 degrees. So the angle for gravity is actually going to be 120 degrees. So when I go and calculate the work, each one of these forces is constant. So I can just use work equals the magnitude of that force times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between the force and the displacement. So going through this, what I get is the work done by the normal force. Well, it would be the normal force times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between it. But here's a little hint for problems. I could go and calculate the normal force just by doing the sum of the forces equals ma. But since the angle between the normal force and the displacement is 90 degrees, I don't even need to do it because the cosine of 90 is zero. So the work done by the normal force is just zero joules. What does that mean? That means the normal force is not adding or removing energy from the system. If I want to calculate the work done by FA, it's going to be the magnitude of FA times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between the two, which we saw was 30 degrees. So FA, we were told, was 20 newtons. The displacement was 0.5 meters, and my angle was 30 degrees. What I get for the work done by FA, what do I get? Oh, I didn't actually calculate it. Let's calculate it now. 20 times 0.5 times cosine of 30. What I get is 8.66 joules of work done by force FA. Now let's calculate the work done by gravity. The work done by gravity is going to be the force of gravity mg times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between the two, which in this case was 120 degrees. So my mass was three kilograms. My displacement again was 0.5 meters, and I have a cosine of 120 degrees. When I take three times 0.5 times cosine of 120, what I, three, oh, I forgot the G in here, sorry, times 9.8 meters per second squared. So three times nine, 3 times 9.8 times 0.5 times cosine of 120 equals negative 7.35 joules. So notice the work done by gravity is negative because I am increasing an in elevation, right? Anytime the elevation increases, gravity's doing negative work. Anytime the elevation decreases, gravity's doing positive work. So my total work done by all external forces equals the work done by the normal force plus the work done by force FA plus the work done by MG, the gravity. And what I get if I add all these up is 1.31 joules. That's the total work done by all external forces, which means the energy of this system changes by 1.3 joules. What we want is what is the final speed so I know that the total work done by all forces is gonna equal the change in energy of the system. And right now we're just dealing with kinetic energy. So it's one half M V final squared minus one half M V initial squared. We were told it starts from rest. So the initial speed is zero. So the initial kinetic energy is zero. So what I get is the total work done by all forces equals one half m v final squared. So it started from rest. So the total work done is going to increase the kinetic energy of the system. I can figure out the speed 
by taking the square root of two times the total work divided by the mass. Once I plug in those values, which you'll find is I get 0.935 meters per second. So total work done by all external forces equals the change in energy of the system. Right now, the only form we're looking at is kinetic energy, but we're about to start looking at thermal energy and how to deal with that. So before I do that, let me just pause this for a second, stop this share, and just see if there's any questions about that particular example problem that I just did. Very typical problem. I wanna know how much the energy changes or how much the speed changes. I look at the total work done, and then I relate that to the change of energy. In this case, it was final kinetic minus initial kinetic. Uh, I found an answer book. It all, is work only equal to the difference in kinetic energy, or could it be other forces like a spring force? <clears throat> so any force can do work, and the total work done on a system by all forces equals the change in energy of the system. Right now in chapter nine, we're only looking at kinetic energy, and then I'm gonna add thermal energy in a second. Then in chapter 10, we're gonna start looking at interactions and potential energy. Uh, can I show the problem again? Screen share, go back up here. Share, let me make it a little smaller. So why don't I have a little thing there? Okay, here's the problem again. Four things. Okay, so the last two things, just as a little preview of what we're covering. So the last part, two parts of this chapter, we're gonna start looking at restoring forces. So basically a spring, and what we're gonna see is the force exerted by a spring is equal to negative K times delta X, where X is how much the spring is stretched or compressed. We're gonna look at when there is friction, thermal energy is generated, and how much thermal energy increases is gonna be given by, oh, not delta X, delta FX, it's gonna be given by the force of kinetic friction times displacement over which kinetic friction acts, and the very last thing we're going to look at is power, which is how much the energy of a system changes with respect to time, but it's also equal to how much work a force does as a function of time. So let me look at just restoring forces, and I want to do this a bit with lecture notes. Let me scroll down to... Okay. So restoring forces. So let me just say that this chapter where we're looking at restoring forces, let me draw for a second, do this in green. We are going to be focusing on a spring. And let me just say the reason we care about springs is because a spring has this certain property that the force that a spring exerts is negative some constant times how much the spring is stretched or compressed. And the reason we care about springs is not because springs themselves are so useful, but because there's many models, many physical systems that can be modeled like a spring, where as the displacement gets farther and farther from equilibrium, the force pulling it back to equilibrium gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So like another example of a system like this might be a ball rolling back and forth, inside a uh, bowl or something like that. The sum of the forces is zero when the object is right here at rest, but as the object gets displaced away from equilibrium, there's always a force sort of trying to pull it back. So a couple things about this. K is called the spring constant. It's just a number that describes how stiff the spring is. A stiffer spring has a bigger spring constant. A not stiff spring has a small spring constant. The units of the spring constant are newtons per meter. 
So if I had a spring constant, let's say of two newtons per meter, what this really means, it means it would take a force of two newtons to stretch spring by one meter is basically what it means. And I forgot to grab springs from the lab, and uh, which means I'm not gonna have springs for the rest of the semester, unfortunately. So a couple definitions here. X equilibrium. This is known as the equilibrium length. This is when the spring is not stretched, it's not compressed. It's just the normal resting state of the spring. If I stretch a spring, so I pull a spring, then in general, delta x is considered to be positive when the spring is stretched. So in this case, here's my where equilibrium would be where the spring is not stretched or compressed. If I stretch it a distance delta x, the force that the spring exerts is always in the opposite direction of the displacement. So if I pull a spring to the right, it's exerting a force to the left. In this case, if instead of stretching a spring, I compress it a certain distance. Now delta x is considered to be negative and the force is always in the opposite direction of the displacement. So just so you know, that's what this negative sign means is that if delta x is positive to the right, the spring exerts a force to the left. So for a spring, a spring is always exerting a force in the opposite direction of the displacement. So let's just say here's my spring with a mass connected to it. If this is my equilibrium position, this is when the spring is not stretched or not compressed. If I were to then stretch that spring, how much it stretches is my delta x. And the way we define delta x is just delta x is my position minus my equilibrium position. And so if you stretch something 0.2 meters, my delta x would be 0.2 meters. How much force the spring exerts is just gonna be equal to the spring constant. That looks like a theta right there negative the spring constant times delta x. So we call this Hooke's law. Why Hooke's law? Because somebody named Hooke is the one who studied it. And it says this, the force that the spring exerts is equal to negative some constant times this called the spring constant times how much the spring is displaced away from equilibrium. And so the more I stretch a spring, the bigger the force is pulling it back to equilibrium. The more I push a spring, the bigger the force is pulling it back to equilibrium. Uh, okay, so let me just pause there. So <clears throat> I wish we had lab because one of the easiest ways to the question, how would you figure out the force, the spring constant of a spring? And let me just tell you the most general way is just to hang a mass from it. So let's say that I have a spring and this is where the spring is not stretched or not compressed. And I wanna know what is the spring constant of the spring? The easiest way to do that would be to hang a mass off the end of the spring, some mass M, which is going to stretch the spring a distance. Here, I'm just gonna use delta Y. Well, if this mass is at rest, there's only two forces acting on the mass. I've got gravity acting straight down, mg, and I've got the spring exerting a force, k delta x straight up. Now, one thing about the minus sign. The minus sign just indicates that the direction of the force is in the opposite direction of the displacement. So in this case, if the spring is displaced downwards, then that means the force the spring is exerting is upwards. You don't use the minus sign in Newton's second law. So if I wanted to know what is the spring constant, I could say sum of the forces in the y direction equals may, which is zero, because it's not moving. We're assuming this mass is hanging at rest. So what I would get is k times delta x minus mg equals zero. I could solve for my spring constant by just looking at how much the spring is stretched when I hang a certain amount of mass onto it. 
OK, so one thing I want to just go through quickly, just because I want to finish this chapter today, is the force that a spring exerts is not constant. Because the force a spring exerts depends upon how much this spring is stretched or compressed, which means as delta x gets bigger, the force the spring exerts gets bigger. So it's not constant, which means I can't use work equals f dot delta x or delta r to calculate the work. I can't do this because the force is not constant. So the only way to calculate it then is to use the work equals the integral of fx dx. And I'm just going to skip this derivation. It's right here. It's in the book. But the end result is if I put in negative k delta x and I integrate that, what I get is the work done by a spring is negative one half or negative one half k delta x final squared minus one half k delta x initial squared. Okay, I know I went through that kind of fast. But springs, I wanted to kind of get through quickly because I want to just talk about thermal energy. So let me just pause for 30 seconds, open it up for any quick questions about springs. And let me see if I can pull up this chat window. Hey, Joe. Yes. Um, is that the first non-constant force we've looked at? That is the first non-constant force we looked at, and it will probably be the only non-constant force you're going to be dealing with. Okay. Okay. So the very last thing I want to talk about, well, and maybe just touch on power is thermal energy. So let me stop this share for a second. And I want to insert page templates blank college ruled. Okay, so the very last thing we're going to look at besides power at the very end is thermal energy. And basically, I think of thermal energy as heat. Anytime there is friction or air resistance, I can't tell if I'm sharing this screen or not. Uh, can you guys see the thermal energy? No, no I'm not sharing this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now hopefully you can see it. So we're gonna look at thermal energy and I'm just gonna give you a little preview. Thermal energy, the equation is the change in thermal energy equals the force of kinetic friction times the displacement over which kinetic friction is acting. And let me just say that you always see thermal energy as the change in thermal energy. In general, we don't know my initial thermal energy and my final thermal energy. What I can tell you is if friction is present, a certain amount of heat is going to be generated, I can tell you how much heat was generated. But what I can't tell you is what was the thermal energy beforehand? What was the thermal energy afterwards? Thermal energy is the sum of all the kinetic and potential energies of all the atoms and molecules that make up an object or system. If it heats up, then those atoms and molecules start moving faster and faster, their kinetic energy increases. But I generally don't know what was the kinetic energy to begin with, the kinetic energy after. What I know is how much the thermal energy changed. Okay, so when are we going to do this? So in the beginning, we were just kind of looking at particles. I had a single force acting on a single particle. Now we're going to start looking at macroscopic sized objects. Crates, boxes, things moving up and down inclined planes. And if I have a macroscopic sized objects, in addition to kinetic energy of the object moving as a whole, 
There's also thermal energy of all the atoms and molecules that make up the object. So for macroscopic sized objects, we also need to consider thermal energy. And let me just, I think I have this better in the lecture notes. Let me just, that's April 2nd. Let me just scroll down here for a second. Sorry, this is going so fast. Whoa. Yeah, a lot of notes, 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 a lot of notes. Okay. So when I'm looking at just particles, the only form of energy we really had was kinetic energy. I just had a couple different particles, but if I'm considering a macroscopic sized object, like me pushing a crate across the floor, I also have to look at all of the kinetic and potential energies of the atoms and molecules that make up the object. As that object, let's say, is sliding across a floor, friction is converting some of the kinetic energy into thermal energy. And that causes the atoms and molecules in the object to start moving faster, increasing the overall thermal energy. So when I have a macroscopic sized object, here is my new sort of work energy principle is the sum of the external forces on a system. Keep in mind this right here is the sum of all the external forces acting on a system, changes the energy of the system, and we're only looking at two forms right now, kinetic energy, and now we're gonna start looking at thermal energy. And what I'm gonna do is a really quick, easy derivation for how you get this equation for thermal energy. So bear with me. I'm going to do an example, very generic example. We're going to pull a box across a floor at a constant velocity. Constant velocity basically means that the speed is not changing, so the change in kinetic energy is zero. If I look, there are four forces acting on this box as it's sliding across the floor. I've got the normal force, which is straight up. I've got gravity, which is straight down. I'm assuming I'm pulling with some tension force to the right, and I've got kinetic friction acting to the left. My system is the box and the surface. And one of the things I'm gonna emphasize in a second is, anytime you're going to include thermal energy, your system has to include all objects whose temperature is changing. So as a box slides across the floor, the box is heating up and the floor is heating up. I need to look at both objects if I'm going to include thermal energy. So in this case then, my system is the box and the surface. My work done by all forces is gonna change the kinetic energy and the thermal energy, but in this particular case, I'm assuming I'm dragging the box at a constant velocity, which means the kinetic energy is not changing. So what I have is the work done by all external forces equals the change in kinetic energy plus the change in thermal energy. The change in kinetic energy is zero because we're assuming the box is moving at a constant velocity. So the work done by external forces, I have four forces that are going to be doing work possibly. I, oh, I'm sorry. Aha. I defined my system as the box and the surface, which means the normal force is an internal force because it's a surface acting on the box. So what forces do I have that are doing work? Welp, I've got basically tension and I've got gravity mg. So let me be specific. My system is the box plus the surface. What that means is frictional force, which is the force that the surface is exerting on a box, is an internal force, so I don't need to look at it when I'm looking at the work done by external forces. So the only forces working or doing work that are external 
are tension and gravity. But the work done by gravity is equal to zero because the angle between the because the angle between gravity and the displacement is 90 degrees. So the only thing that's doing work is the work done by tension. So what I get from this work done by external forces equals the change in kinetic energy plus the change in thermal energy. Kinetic energy is not changing. The only force that's doing work is tension. So the work done by tension is going to be equal to the change in thermal energy. Well, the work done by tension is just the force of tension times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between them, which in this case is zero, which equals the change in thermal energy. But here's the key point. If I'm pulling something at a constant velocity, then I know the sum of the forces in the x direction is zero, which means tension minus the force of kinetic friction is zero. So tension is gonna equal the force of kinetic friction. So I can replace for tension the force of kinetic friction. And what I get is the change in thermal energy equals the force of kinetic friction times the displacement over which kinetic friction is acting. So going back to this sort of thermal energy for a second, two important points. One, this change in thermal energy is always going to be equal to the force of kinetic friction times the displacement over which it's acting. And again, we don't generally know what the initial thermal energy is or the final thermal energy, just how much the thermal energy is increasing. And the second thing is your system, when you define it, must include all objects whose temperature changes. Okay, so in this particular case, going back, I was pulling a box across the floor at a constant velocity by some tension force here. I defined my system as the box plus the surface, which means that kinetic friction was an internal force and the normal force was an internal force because those are both forces that the surface is exerting on the box. Now, you can look at these multiple ways that we'll do in chapter 10, but if I defined my system as just the box, now I can't include thermal energy because I have to have all objects that are heating up as part of the system. So if I only define my system as the box, now what ends up happening is kinetic friction is an external force which is doing work. In this case, it's doing negative work and it's decreasing the, well, in this case, tension is doing positive work kinetic friction would be doing negative work, which would be offsetting the positive work done by tension, resulting in the kinetic energy not changing. But if I include as my system the surface, then kinetic friction is an internal force, which is causing heat to be generated. Whew. All right, let me pause for a second, stop this, check out what uh, just for the first four of class makes sense, recap. Oh. I still have this recap on. <laughs> if you define surface as box and system and normal force included, why do you include, if you define surface and box as system and normal force included, why isn't gravity? So gravity is always the earth pulling on the object. So me defining the system as the box plus the surface, the surface is just the floor. We're not talking about the mass of the entire earth as a whole just the floor. Okay, very last thing. And just so you know, on Wednesday tomorrow, the lab tomorrow, I cut down drastically. It's a very short lab. I am going to record another lecture tomorrow. 
that is just going to basically be recapping all of chapter nine, doing a couple example problems. And I'm going to do that for the next two labs. So this week's lab is conservation of energy part one. Very short, it's already posted. Next week's lab will be conservation of energy part two. Both of those labs are going to be very short. And on Wednesdays for the next two weeks, I'm going to record an additional lecture, maybe 30 minutes. I will upload that hopefully by tomorrow. Uh, I'm done with office hours at one. I'll upload it by like three o'clock. Can you go back? So let's go back to share screen, share that. Okay, very last thing I wanna talk about really quick, new section, uh, another new sec, can I just add another section, is power. And just real quick, I am not going to quiz you on chapter nine on power. We will deal with it a little bit more next chapter. It'll come up a bunch in 4B. I just want to introduce it conceptually now. So one, power is a concept that describes the rate at which energy is transformed or work is done. Quick little question for everybody. What is the power, I'm sorry, never mind. Rewind. What is the unit of power? It wasn't a question. <laughs> it was a statement. The unit of power is the what? Oh. So the way we define or the way we measure power is in watts and one watt is equal to one joule per second. So just as a quick example, a 100 watt light bulb means that every second, 100 joules of energy are being transformed, in this case, from electrical energy into light and heat. The way we define power is, the power is equal to the rate at which the energy of a system is changing or the rate at which work is being done. These are two equivalent definitions. I can either think of power as the rate at which I'm transforming energy from one form to another or the rate at which I'm doing work on an object. And let me just go to this lecture notes real quick. Uh, you can also show that power for specific force can be written as F times V times the cosine of the angle. I'm not gonna deal with that at all. And there's gonna be no power questions on the chapter nine quiz. And that's really all chapter nine content. There's a couple example problems I wanna do, and I'm gonna do those tomorrow. So tomorrow uh, by hopefully 2.30 or something like that, maybe three o'clock, I will upload another 30 minute lecture. It's not gonna be on Zoom. I'm just gonna record it at home and then upload it to YouTube. And that's sort of gonna be it. We're pretty much done chapter nine. I just wanna do one or two more example problems. Keep in mind, schedule for this week is PLCs due today, labs due tomorrow, chapter nine homework due Thursday, quiz on Friday. Quizzes and homework must be due at 8.59 p.m. So let me stop this and open it up. Ah, my nose is killing me, sorry. Uh, open it up for questions. Questions, questions, questions. Okay, there's no question, yes. Is there any way I could just turn in the PLC at 12? I've got like two other things that are due at nine tonight. Turn, oh, so I'm sorry, the PLCs and the labs just do by midnight the night that they're due. Okay. So it's the ones where you're actually inputting stuff in Mastering Physics using the little uh, multiple choice for the homework and quizzes. Those have a due date 8.59. Just, uh, yeah, that's the way the system is set up. Everything's Eastern Standard Time. Wait, it, 8.59 when, like, uh, 
what time zone? So 8.59 California time is when the homeworks and quizzes will be due. Okay. On Mastering Physics, it'll say 11.59 p.m., but that's all Eastern Standard Time. It's East Coast time. So just keep in mind, quizzes, homework, due by 8.59 on the days that they're due. Is there a way to end the quiz when you submit all problems, or do you have to wait until the timer runs out? Ooh. It's a good question. Isn't it where once you do the last uh, quiz question, you can hit submit? Somebody answer me on that who's taken the quiz? Yes. I mean, it wasn't when I took the one on Friday, there wasn't an option to submit it. Or at huh. least I didn't see one. Yeah, Maybe there uh, was and I didn't see it. I think there should be. So just so you know, every time you answer a question, you have to click submit. And also, let me just let you know that- No, I mean, I hit submit on the, I could hit submit on, on the individual problems, but not on the quiz overall. Oh, double check that on the last one and let me know. But once you're yeah. done all the problems, if there's not a submit button, every time you submit a problem individually, you should be good. But I think there's a submit button once you're done to submit it. And it has to be submitted by 8.59. And if you don't, the timer just keeps running. But just so you know, once you click start for the quizzes, you have 60 minutes. And that should be plenty of time because it's just five multiple choice questions. You know, a couple of them are problems, but they're relatively, they're not as hard as I think the quiz problems have been in the past. Hey Joe, your notes are on your website, right? Yes, the notes, let me just pull them up. Uh, Share this real quick. Share screen. Okay, so one, I'm trying to keep sort of this page as your one-stop shopping center for pretty much everything dealing with this class being online. So I updated this, you know, these useful links are the links that <clears throat> are going to be sort of most useful. So Mastering Physics, please use this link. If you're gonna be looking at the expert TA videos, which I highly recommend, here's the link here. And then to my Zoom, you've got schedule of things due in the next week. Like I said, this is our schedule for the week. Here's my office hours and uh, lecture schedule. And I'll generally try and keep that. And then uh, going down, mouse, do 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 do. So lecture notes that I have been showing on one note, these are PDFs of all the lecture notes. Again, these were taken by a student a year ago, same time, really excellent lecture notes, and it's pretty much what I wrote on the board. All of the online lectures are gonna be right here, and they will be in order. The labs, bam, right there. Let me clear that again. Clear all drawings. Mouse. And then the other things are uh, virtual office hours. So again, any office hours where I'm actually answering specific questions about problems and things like that, I'll post here. These OneNote notebooks. So if you have Microsoft OneNote, let me see if I just click on this, if it'll, let me see, open a new tab. Can people see this new tab opening up? Yes. Okay. So if you have Microsoft OneNote, then this is basically all of the notes that I'm doing on it. And I've included the lecture notes that I also have posted before. Uh, why is that taking so long? Okay, I posted the clicker questions and all of that stuff. So that's all there. And then a uh, couple other things I mentioned before, but Angel is still doing the SI sessions on Tuesdays, 2.30 to 4.30, Fridays, 12 to 2. And there's Mesa tutoring pretty much Monday through Saturday, much of the day. So if you click, uh, click here for tutor schedule, open a new tab. I can't see that tab. Right, delete that. Okay. Can people see this tab right here? Yes. Okay. So this is sort of the tutoring for physics through MESA. And so if you look, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, much of the day, you can find somebody online to get some 
help with, um, yeah, anything related to Physics 4A. So what I want to do is I'm going to have uh, lecture office hours for the next uh, about 15, 20 minutes. Student had a good suggestion rather than just ending this Zoom meeting and then restarting it. I need to just grab something to eat real quick. I'm going to just pause my video for five minutes. If people want to stay online and just chat and connect with each other, in about five minutes, I'm going to come back and then just be here for office hours until about 12:30. So I'm going to pause my video for just a few minutes while I use the bathroom and get some food, and then I will come back and then answer any questions. So. Those of you who are going to leave, thank you for tuning in. Remember, I will post another lecture tomorrow afternoon, hopefully by about 3 o'clock, and it's just going to recap Chapter 9, do some example problems. All right, so I'm going to stop my video for now. I'll come back in about three or four minutes for office hours.